Thanks for joining us on Speaking of Nebraska. I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Tonight we're covering two very important topics. We'll hear from Nebraskans impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, millions of people have been gathering across the country and beyond to protest the death of George Floyd, a black man in Minneapolis, while a white police officer knelt on his neck. Nebraskans have gathered by the hundreds and thousands for protests every night for the past week. Becca Costello of NET News has more. For the first time in nearly three months of the COVID-19 pandemic, Nebraskans are coming together in large numbers. Nebraska communities across the state join a now global protest movement opposing police violence against black Americans. All four Minneapolis police officers who detained George Floyd have been fired and charged in his death, including a second degree murder charge for Derek Chauvin, the white man seen on video kneeling on Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. But like the Black Lives Matter protests of the past several years, it's not just about one killing. Say his name, Philando Castillo! Castillo! Philando Castillo! Philando Castillo! Protesters in Lincoln have marched in the streets, blocking traffic and delaying motorists. For many, the disruption is a critical part of the message. But protesters who've spoken publicly say disruption doesn't mean violence. They've been vocal about decrying the property destruction in Lincoln and Omaha on protest nights over the weekend. That vandalism prompted a curfew and an order to bring in the Nebraska National Guard. <laughs> Protesters defied the curfew and police responded with arrests and tear gas to disperse the crowds. But organizers are hopeful this movement will bring about change. In both Omaha and Lincoln, some law enforcement officers and National Guard members took time to stand or kneel with protesters in solidarity. But advocates say a few moments of cooperation isn't enough for change. We want justice. We don't want any more lip service. No more lip service. For Speaking of Nebraska, I'm Becca Costello. Joining us now are State Senator Justin Wayne of Omaha, Lincoln Mayor Lyrian Gaylor Baird, and John Harris, a minister in Lincoln and president of Encouragement Unlimited. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Mayor, we'll start with you a little bit. Um, it's obviously been a, a very hectic uh, past week or so. Um, I want to talk about some of the decisions that you've had to make in regard to crowd control regarding the protests in particular. Can you kind of walk us back a little bit and talk about the decision at times to use more law enforcement and at other times to pull back and not use as much law enforcement? Well, thank you for having me here today. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with both you, um, Senator and Pastor. Uh, our number one priority as a city is to try to keep all of our residents and community members safe. And this has been an incredibly challenging moment to do that because we want to make sure that everyone who wants to raise their voices to be heard, express their uh, First Amendment rights, help amplify important calls for change, have every opportunity to do that, that, in, that in a way that is safe for everyone involved. Um, and at the same time, we'd seen unprecedented uh, violence and destruction starting on Friday night with the convenience store, the EasyGo convenience store. And so every night since that time, we have been evolving and adapting with our decisions to try to make sure that we're creating the most peaceful conditions for people to express themselves, to be heard, so that everyone hears the message that black lives matter, because that message is important. And I am so pleased that our law enforcement officials, um, LPD is a very lean force and they um, rely on for backup, um, the sheriff and others, the state, um, I'm so pleased that they have evolved over the course of the past few nights and 
we've all learned that the way to de-escalate um, involves, you know, not showing up in ways that visually antagonize a crowd. They have stayed inside the buildings and we've seen better results and better opportunities for our peaceful protesters to amplify their message, free from those who were taking advantage of that moment to express their anger in ways that were destruction. Because, you know, as a mayor, I can't condone that kind of violence and destruction that was happening in the community. At the same time, I can't condone the violence that has been inflicted on black people in our community and in, across the country. And as you're making that decision, who are you talking to about we're going to have less police force out there? And how do you come to that decision? You know, um, LPD and Chief Blymeister have community relationships that have helped inform their evolution of procedures and practices. And those community relationships have helped us get to a better place over the last few nights. And so uh, in consultation with um, LPD and other community leaders, we've gotten to a better place. And I want to just thank all of the young people who are stepping forward and showing their leadership. At the protests I've attended night after night, I have heard them demand peace amongst those who attend the rallies. I have heard them call to channel their anger into peaceful demonstration that will allow for better outcomes. And uh, their leadership has been remarkable. And I hope people are listening and watching and seeing the change that they're catalyzing for our community and communities across the country. State Senator Wayne, obviously protests in Lincoln and Omaha, as well as uh, other cities across Nebraska, Grand Island, Shadron, other cities as well. But as you look out and see these protests, What's going through your mind? What are you thinking about and, and how we've progressed through them in the past seven days? I think it's a slightly different feel uh, than what I, I, obviously I wasn't in the 60s and 70s, but when I talk to people, it's a slightly different feel. Uh, and part of it is, is my generation and below, uh, we haven't really went through a, a significant struggle. We've kind of always tried to work within the system. And now people are at a bo boiling point where it's like the system isn't working and they're looking for a way for change and they're looking for a way to get their voice across and many of them uh you know go to the ballot box and many of them just are feeling like that's not enough we need something immediate we need something now and that's part of the generation uh waiting 10 years for something while maybe at a different time they would today they're like no wrong is wrong why don't we fix it today and Working through that is, has been frustrating, uh, especially uh, doing it from a state legislator standpoint, from a public school standpoint, when I used to be on the school board. Um, right is right and wrong is wrong, and people are trying to say, well, if we know it's wrong, or if we know there's problems and the data supports it, then why aren't we changing it tomorrow? And that's the disconnect, I think, from uh, elected officials to uh, people who are in the system or trying to change the system, and we have to figure out how to shorten that timeline. And that's what I think uh, happened in Omaha uh, the first night. And then by the second night, uh, we had people from out of state, agitators come in who agitated the, the, the protest to something that it was, it was what it was not intended to be. Is that your feeling or do you, do you know that those I was there. Um, <laughs> I, I attended both of them. Uh, I, I was on Facebook telling people to go home at one point because this isn't, the message has been lost was my exact words. Uh, that message has now came back around, unfortunately, to a death that happened in Omaha, a tragic death of James Gerlach. But that night, when that, before that death happened uh, in Omaha, particularly, when, we got, when those individuals got downtown, it, it wasn't about the same message. Um, during those protests, you mentioned the death of, uh, of James Skurlock, 22-year-old uh, black man who was shot by a white business owner, Jake Gardner, during a struggle. Uh, and we should point out that you represent the family of James Skurlock as an attorney. Douglas County Attorney Don Klein announced, uh, at least at this time, he has concluded that Gardner acted in self-defense and won't be charged in the crime. Here's a part of his description of why he reached that decision. When we viewed the evidence uh, myself, uh, my chief deputy, we viewed it with all the homicide detectives that were involved in this case, uh, the command staff of the Omaha Police Department, and there wasn't anyone, uh, there was a consensus 
about the evidence that we had at this time in this case and that was that the actions of the shooter the bar owner were justified and state senator wayne as we mentioned you represent the scurlock family and uh, don klein has said that he has since said he supports the calling of a grand jury to review the shooting um do you support that as well yes the, uh, monday we called for a grand jury when uh Don Klein announced that he was not going to pursue charges uh, Wednesday, yesterday. He announced that he will pursue those. And then we added that we need a special prosecutor, someone that the community feels uh, could have faith in and restore faith. So that is a step in the right direction. Uh, I think, uh, to put this in context, there were 4,000 people downtown. Uh, a shooting occurred, two to 300 people ran. They were in the middle of a protest. At the time, the police were moving the line. Uh, witnesses wanted to come back, were told you're part of the protest, you need to move on. Uh, they're still interviewing people today, uh, but it goes to the climate, it goes to this immediate change. I think there were pressure on all parties to do something, uh, and unfortunately for me, I think it was a rush to judgment. I've said that continuously, as we are now putting together uh, hundreds of videos, uh, five or ten second videos, to build this collage of things that happened. This isn't like George uh, Floyd where you had a video that was clear with audio that lasted nine minutes. It's, it's short snippets of here and there. And so while there was pressure to get something done, I do think Don is uh, doing the right spot and I, I right thing. And I want to be clear, Don hired me first. Me and Don have a great relationship. Uh, I just think as humans, people make mistakes. And this is one of the mistakes uh, of a rush to judgment. And there's more evidence coming in. And I think a grand jury will pursue this matter and and give justice for James. All right. Pastor Harris, I want to bring you in on this discussion as well. Um, you, you have been at the, you were at the peaceful rally this weekend. You've been involved with uh, this. You've, through your organization, you've been involved in community relations with the law enforcement. But for you, this is something that takes you back to 2014. You were in, in the, you grew up, I think, in St. Louis, yeah. and uh, you were around with the, the Ferguson uh, situation with the shooting of Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. Are there any parallels? I know it's, it's two dramatically different situations, but, but what, what were the lessons learned in Ferguson that you think could be applied in, in Nebraska? Well, you know, there, there are three phases uh, that happen in these kinds of situations. The, the first is that of an outcry. Uh, where's the justice? Where, you know, as you said there, what's wrong here? Uh, and after you, you, it becomes a bit cathartic, you start to get an outrage. You're mad, you know? The, and the question then becomes, after that outcry and that outrage, uh, what's the outcome? And, and can we move that, out, that rage, that outrage, into a positive outcome? And, and I think that's the parallel for me. You know, when I drove down the streets of, uh, of Ferguson, uh, you know, living in Nebraska and seeing it, I had to be there. So I went to Ferguson. I went to the place where I live. Michael Brown was killed in the complex where I used to live. And so that was really telling. But as I drove down West Florissant, which is the main drag, and saw the, the buildings burned out, and I saw this was the initial first protest where things were really decimated. Uh, I started to think about Lincoln because the protest that we held here was held on Saturday, last Saturday. Uh, some of what the mayor was talking about happened on last Friday. And I began to think about the parallel between the buildings and the, the looting and all this stuff. And I, I remembered, I went back, my mind literally went back to that drive down West Florida, and I was like, is, is that gonna happen in Lincoln? And I thought to myself, no, it can't happen here. No more. Uh, we, we can't let people come in. And that's what happened in Ferguson. People came from outside and they began to create this mob mentality and then burned up the places where now people still don't have shopping, uh, food, gas, whatever. They still don't have those places. So they come in and they mess it up for the people who actually live there. And so I said to the young people on Saturday night, don't let that happen here. Don't let people come into our city and take from us what, what belongs to us, what, what we need. And, and they heard that message. Now, again, uh, some things did happen Saturday night, but the majority, as the mayor said, a lot of those young people proclaimed, we want peace. We want peace. And they said that out loud. Uh, but again, others try to take the message sideways. They try to detract from what the real issue is. And the real issue is that a man, as, as the senator said, died right before our eyes. And so let's not get sidetracked by that. Uh, Ferguson does have some parallels in that, um, that outrage and that it has turned into, uh, needs to turn into positive 
a positive outcome. Some of those things are happening here uh, as they did in the aftermath of what happened in Ferguson. People became empowered because they realized what their power was. And, and that's the move we're trying to make now, helping our young people to understand what power do you have? Uh, in the aftermath of all the protesting and walking and standing that you're going to do. So with the work you've been doing in the Lincoln community, where do you think we are when it comes to relations between uh, the black community and law enforcement? In 2017, when Chief Flymeister first came on board, uh, uh, Encouragement Unlimited sponsored five community conversations across this city. And, and, uh, and we have a document on our website that references the final product of those conversations. Uh, we talked about these things. The citizens of our city, we, because Chief Blymeister was new, just came to city. And so these conversations helped to build a foundation for his understanding of what the citizens of Lincoln were thinking relative to police relations, community relations, and so forth. And so uh, we got an understanding at least then. We're three, three years removed from that initial uh, five conversations. We actually were going to start restart the conversations before the COVID-19 uh, actually stopped us. Mm -hmm. And so we would have had those conversations already before this happened, uh, but now we're delayed uh, and they will, they will happen again. So we've, we've made efforts. One thing I do know, and I'll say this quickly, is that I spoke to the Lincoln Police Department, every person in the staff, right after our, our fifth conversation. And I challenged them to never let their personal opinion uh, overtake their training. I asked them about their values, one of which is life and what that means to every individual in the department. And to a person, uh, I got a sense that they understand that if something happens in the Lincoln Police Department of a, of a nature that's egregious, people are going to get dealt with. There's going to be accountability. Can there be greater accountability? That's where we are now. Lincoln Mayor Gaylor Baird, uh, you went out, met the, met the protesters on the streets, you talked with them and you listened to them. What did you hear? A lot of anguish. There's just so much pain and so much anger, rightfully so. And God, just, they're tired and they're so committed, even though they're tired, to making sure everyone hears their message that black lives matter, that white people have work to do and they shouldn't depend on black people to do that work for them. And that we have systemic inequalities in America that prevent people from having equal opportunities. The idea that everyone could just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that kind of American myth, they're dispelling that myth. They're saying my lived experience says that that's not true. And so they're looking to end racial injustice, to end systemic oppression. And they want people to walk with them. It's really, it's both an outcry, an outrage, looking for outcomes and an invitation they're, they're extending their hand and asking people to walk with them to make our community safer for everyone. They want everyone to feel safe. They don't want anyone to live in fear. And unfortunately, too many black people in our community and across the nation have to have talks with their kids about how to stay safe. And that's unacceptable. And they're expressing that. State Senator Wayne, how do we get to a solution then? You're a member of the legislature. Is the legislature going to be able to, to do something uh, from that avenue? Are your colleagues going to support something like that? You told our Fred Knapp yesterday, we're on the verge of making a change or we're on the verge of burning down a city. How do you feel? Where, where are we and where are we going to end up? We are at that critical juncture, uh, not just in Nebraska, particularly Omaha. We're at that critical juncture across the country. Uh, to everything that's been said here, people want action, but the problem with action is people don't uh, necessarily understand the subtles of the legacy of the tentacles of racism. And that's where this frustration with young people are. So let's take, uh, I also have a small business contracting. Let's take contracting. If you were to make a deal or put together a, a, a building you wanna build and typically people call their best friends, like, hey, I'm working on this project, help me out. Well, people who look like me have never been in the room at the country clubs in the 70s and 80s to build those family relationships. So when you start building that complex, we've never got the opportunity to gain that wealth. And so people are looking at that like, well, I'm not racist. I just don't know anybody. I just don't know anybody from that side. But that's not your fault as the business owner. 
you weren't born in, I mean, you were born in that situation. You didn't go out and do anything overly or covertly to be racist. It's just the, nat it's the natural tentacles of racism. And I think what I hear from young people is, I don't know how to get over that. Somebody has to help me understand and navigate that. And that's really gonna be done at the local level, at the, at the state level, like in contracting, there's things we can do around helping DBEs, disadvantaged businesses, people from poverty to get an equal chance. Um, but if you approach it from a racial lens, people get defensive because they're like, well, I'm not a racist. I have plenty of minorities and people who work for me, but they don't understand that there's a bigger picture. And it's, that's the struggle because it isn't, the reality is, is these young people are okay. And not, not okay, like they condone it, but they'll accept somebody for their beliefs. And if you think they're, if, if I'm a flat out racist, they just won't talk to you. It's the people who are not racist, their best friends who have these overtones and they can't figure it out and they get frustrated. And that's what you're seeing in society right now is like, I can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. We're Democrats, Republicans, liberals, whatever, but I can't figure out why we still have the stats say what they are. Yeah. Let me, let me, uh, let me jump in. Sure. You know, my other life is that of a consultant. I do uh, cultural competency uh, training across the nation for different companies and, and organizations of one kind or another. And the one thing that, that strikes me, you know, growing up in St. Louis, I grew up in an all black community. I grew up in a community where there was at best just one white family. And, uh, and for all intents and purposes, all I knew was being black. And I didn't care that I didn't know white people. I didn't care that I didn't know Hispanic people. I didn't care because everything we had and everything we needed was right there in my community. And, and so everybody else was a stranger and it didn't matter. And, 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 and what's interesting is it wasn't until I left my community it wasn't until I was able to see other people that I was able to dispel the stereotypes that I had, that I was able to, to overcome a lot of the things that, that, that were not true in terms of my perception. Mm -hmm. Well, many people grow up like that. Many people grow up as strangers. And, and they get these, these not only, uh, I don't necessarily call them racist idea, but they become what we call bigots. You know, you become a bigot. You become a person who, who has your perspective, and that's all that matters. And, 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 and our systems create us to be patriotic. They don't create us to be familiar. Right. And so that's the challenge we have because we're not just talking about law enforcement. We're talking about education. We're talking about business. We're talking about the systems that allow us to be un the United States of America as opposed to the, the continuous divided states mm -hmm. of America. May Mayor Gaylor Bell will give you the last word. We just have about 30 seconds left. Do you feel like we're on the right track here? Well, if these young leaders... <laughs> are any indication, then yes, because they give me a lot of hope about the kind of um, future that we have, because they're leading today and they'll be leading tomorrow, and we're counting on them to help get us to a better place where everyone is valued and can achieve their full human potential. Okay. Thank you so much, Mayor Larry and Gaylor Baird of Lincoln, State Senator uh, Justin Wayne of Omaha and Pastor John Harris of Lincoln as well. Thank you all for being here and for this discussion. This interview and tonight's program are available on our website. Uh, all you have to do is go to netnebraska.org slash speaking of Nebraska. From protests to the ongoing pandemic, we now focus on the impact COVID-19 has had on our lives for the past three months. Centers of worship are often a source of support for a community, but they were shut down along with other gatherings in the state. Although the state has now allowed them to reopen under certain restrictions, many have made the decision to remain closed out of caution. The work of ministry has changed significantly as these two faith leaders describe. My name is Stephen Neal. I'm the pastor of St. Mark's Lutheran Church here in St. Paul, Nebraska. I'm pretty sure just about every pastor across the country has seen our job change tremendously over the last few months. The most obvious being that our buildings have been closed and that our pews have been empty. We're not opening our home um, to visitors. And most of the time, if somebody comes by, they'll stay in the car on the other side of the sidewalk there in the, in, in the little parking lot area. And I'll stand, you know, six, 10, 15 feet away. Um, and, and we'll have to almost kind of shout to hear each other. So interacting with parishioners is different because we still have very intimate, very personal, very vulnerable conversations and, and, and 
prayers together, but with our voices raised and trying to be sure that we can be heard over any of the cars or trucks that are, that are driving by. So every evening at around 8 o'clock, I venture out to the front of the church with my daughters um, and we ring the church bell. And we ring the church bell to let our community know that the church is here for them, that we are here for them, that God is always with them. Maybe they need a little bit of hope. Maybe they need a little bit of resilience or a little bit of patience. Um, maybe they take that time to sit back and to reflect on the larger world around them, to reflect on, on what they can do to serve their community, or to reflect on, on the things that they are grateful for that God has given us in our lives. My name is Cantor Joanna Alexander. I'm the Cantor at Temple Israel of Omaha, which is um, on the Tri-Faith campus. I no longer take the time to rehearse with musicians because I can't use them, um, because I, I can't have them play and me sing at the same time. It doesn't work over Zoom with the delay. So those are things that I, that I really miss, the collaboration of the musical instruments and things like that. In many ways, it takes courage as a participant to sit at home by yourself, maybe with your cat or your dog on your lap, and say, oh, this is a prayer I'm supposed to stand up for. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to sing it out loud to the nobody or to the somebody in my house. That is an act of courage that not everybody feels comfortable doing. I think our, our risk assessment is always going to be with a notion of pikuach nefesh, which is the Hebrew word for um, saving life. In Judaism, you're allowed to break almost any commandment in order to save and protect life. So I think a lot of our thoughts on how to reopen have to do with that in mind. And I think some of the things I've struggled with are really the bringing comfort to people in a time of, of sorrow. So um, somebody who is bereaved where you can't be in the room with them, you can't give them a hug, you can't do the normal gathering rituals. That was, I think, particularly hard to contemplate and also to live through. Um, and I hope that I'm able to, to come to the understanding that what we did was enough um, and to help everybody else feel that what they did was enough because we really didn't have another choice. It's been nearly three months since Nebraskans started socially distancing from others. Many have been isolated at home, dealing with the challenges and anxieties of a global pandemic without their usual support system. Joining us now to talk about mental health and the impact of coronavirus is Sherry Dawson, the director of the Nebraska Division of Behavioral Health at the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you for having me. What a, what a three, four months that we've gone through. Just overall, what do you think has been the mental impact on the average citizen? Mm -hmm. Well, I think anytime you have the uncertainty um, and information comes out um, and makes people fearful, um, the overall impact um, naturally is um, increasing our anxiety. And um, I think anytime that uh, you have that unknown, um, it does create challenges for people, their overall mental health. And then with individuals that um, already have a mental illness or substance use disorder, it can just exacerbate that if we're not making sure um, things are going well. Talk about the long-term effects of social isolation on a person. And, and I'm thinking about the people in particular in the long-term care facilities that maybe have been isolated now for, for three months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, again, um, especially certain populations, I think some of our elderly population in particular, um, that touch, um, they grew up with hugs and, and um, uh, elder people like to hold hands and so forth. And so that has been um, really challenging. And then not having um, not only that touch, but that direct um, 
uh, contact with family members um, has certainly been challenged. Um, I think in older persons, again, we have to be really careful in screening for depression um, and increased anxiety. Um, I know that from some of our helpline calls, especially um, in long-term care where we tend to see older adults, um, we're trying to train up people uh, regarding depression and even suicide um, because it just feels like we're not going to be able to move through this. You mentioned those helpline calls. Are we seeing an increase in treatment for mental uh, emo and emotional issues during this pandemic? Yes, I think um, we have evidence on our helplines that those calls are up. Um, our behavioral health providers across the state are fabulous. Um, they are still open um, either through telehealth or some still have offices open and there are many services that have seen an increase. There's also some that tend to be in a group setting or residential um, because of the impact in health and safety maybe have a lower number, but definitely more people people coming to attention. I think it's important to point out also that this is not a one-size-fits-all solution, that everybody can react to this differently. So even though uh, this pandemic may not be affecting you personally, it could be affecting other people in your household or yes. at the workplace. Yes, absolutely. And I think one of the really important things when we have uncertainty is whenever we can put um, structure to that or we can put a routine to the the things that are uncertain, um, it can help us all do well. Um, but that worry and anxiety, not only, again, to your point about how it is impacting you, but then maybe you have children um, that uh, live far away, uh, family members, um, community members, um, it just does build up. Now you mentioned those with serious mental health issues or substance uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. How has treatment changed for them during the pandemic? Yes, well, our uh, providers have been very creative um, and telehealth um, has been um, uh, grown um, exponentially. And so people um, are having uh, more uh, telehealth, so it's still in um, face to face, if you will. And actually some of the providers have reported that um, the, the um, appointments um, are up because people used to have to find transportation to an appointment. Now they can sit in their own home. So actually we have some um, behavioral health providers that are busier um, because people are in their own home and the access is good. Uh, what about as, as the state starts to reopen, our society starts to reopen, I imagine that that can cause some fear and anxiety for people as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, not only um, what, we're, uh, what we've dealt with, and um, if you've experienced a loss, your loss of your job, I mean, you have all that going. And then to um, the reopening, while people are anxious to get out there and um, uh, be more socially connected and get back to their routine, um, again, you go home and, and um, you know, you're going to worry about, well, was there something um, that I contacted. And so um, it's going to be interesting. Um, the other thing I just want to point out real quickly is what we know about COVID um, and traumas and disaster is that we see a longer term effect. So you may experience now, but in a year, year and a half, that's when we're really going to have to be watching. Right. And you've got the Network of Care website as well that people can go to, and we'll have that on yes. our website as well. Yes. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sherry Dawson is the Director of Division of uh, Behavioral Health at the Nebraska Department of Health and Service, uh, Human Services. And you can join the conversation about COVID-19 and mental health on social media. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at NET News Nebraska. More than 100,000 Nebraskans applied for unemployment benefits since the economy shut down. Many waited a month or more to receive a check because of the record-breaking number of applicants. And a survey from the University of Nebraska at Omaha found 87% of businesses were negatively impacted by the pandemic. 16% feared going out of business. As these Nebraskans explain, the economic impact is severe. Hi, my name is Brian Hill. I am um freelance marketing consultant um, and, and small business owner from Omaha, Nebraska. Main business I was involved in, the one I partnered in, um, you know, things things slowed down appreciably. <laughs> um, some may say fell off a cliff when sports came to a, a screeching halt. Um, we had to adjust. So we had to figure out ways to uh, deliver some of our training online. And so uh, I went and, you know, kind of redesigned a couple of things that we were doing um, and really recreated a platform uh, to deliver online training to our clients. 
so that they can do some of the workouts at home. You know, it's basically launching a new product. So I had to uh, pivot real quick and figure out how to, the best way to get this entire thing launched. I think the questions and concerns moving forward uh, for the for the sports based business is. We got guidance on some sports and other sports we haven't really discussed. You know, we're really planning our year around summer basketball season as a business. And so, um, figuring out what we're going to do. Hi, my name is Raquel Gauna, and I live in Plattsmouth, Nebraska. Um, in the beginning of March, my one-year-old daughter got really sick. Um, I took her to the, pediatri- to the pediatrician and we were just told that she had a viral infection to take her home, give her some love, and she'd be okay. Um, I went back to work, took my daughter back to childcare, and at the end of the week, she had a seizure at childcare. So I picked her up and I took her to the ER. Um, a physician at the ER said that it was maybe COVID, maybe not COVID. They just did not have enough supplies there to test her. So just to take her home, and again, just to, um, keep an eye on her at home, make sure she was okay. So I called my work. I let, let my employer know that my daughter was sick. Um, my partner and I just took the next two weeks um, rotating shifts, keeping an eye on her, making sure that she was okay, uh, making sure her fever was low grade. Um, and I told my employer that um, maybe it was COVID. I didn't know. Um, I asked them about the two weeks pay um, wanting to know if I was going to get paid for it. Um, I did not get my two weeks full pay, and shortly after that, I was like, oh. Hey, I'm Alan. I am a 40-year-old business owner. COVID-19 has forced a lot of small businesses out of business. I was fortunate enough to not to have to go out of business. Um, I own a gym. I own a small boot camp gym. So I had to reduce my class sizes to about half of what my uh, normal sessions run. Um, the biggest impact would have been financial. I had, gosh, I have quite a few members that decided to either freeze their accounts or to cancel. Um, and this being my full-time job, I don't work outside of the gym or anything. Like that. The gym is my my one and only source of income. So having to allow people to cancel their membership or freeze their membership put a drastic dent um, in my income. Um, if you're not bringing home money, it's gonna, it makes it difficult to pay bills, to provide for your children, um, things like that. So that that made things pretty rough. Um, I did get creative and had some uh, online training um, and just come up with some different ideas. I, I believe that you don't run out of resources, you run out of resourcefulness. So I did have to become a little more resourceful than what I normally am. I think the biggest impact was not being able to get moments back. There's a couple times where I went to go visit my parents. My parents didn't want to hug me. I didn't want to hug them. We're in the house with masks on, not interacting with each other like family should. You don't get those moments back. My name is uh, Carlos Barreda, and I drive Uber and Lyft in Lincoln, Nebraska. A couple of passenger stories that stay with me are One of them is a waitress. She lived paycheck to paycheck. And when the pandemic started, uh, she and her two children had to move in with her parents. And now that the economy is uh, reopening, she's torn in between the need to make some money and the fear of bringing COVID to her parents and the worry of what would happen to her children if she is infected. Uh, The other story is about um, non-English speaking, poorly uh, educated, undocumented alien from El Salvador. She was working cleaning houses, but when the pandemic started, most of her work dried up. Of course, there was no stimulus check for her and no unemployment. Uh, She was cooking pupusas to try to feed her children, and neither she nor her children had insurance. I told her that the state would provide insurance for her kids at no risk to her or her kids, but she was so afraid of being deported that she didn't want to take advantage of any of the programs that could be available for her. 
The industry most impacted by COVID-19 is meatpacking and processing. State officials say at least 3,000 workers have been infected and at least 11 have died. Advocates are working to establish more safety measures for this population of workers in a vulnerable position. I understand that my parents fall under the essential worker category. And like all frontline workers, our plant workers, our parents, our neighbors deserve the same protection. Our immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers that keep the food industry running came to this country with one purpose, to provide for their families. Our Somali, Karen, Mexican, Guatemalan, Sudanese, Vietnamese, and all other immigrant populations are the backbone of employers like Smithfield, Tyson, JBS, and Cargill. It is thanks to our immigrant populations that we have had food during this pandemic. We will continue to advocate and raise awareness on injustice towards plant workers, but we can't do it alone. Solidarity is how change happens. When people of different walks of life acknowledge the problem is a human problem, and yes, it is disproportionately affecting our oppressed populations. Remember, tu lucha es mi lucha. Your struggle is my struggle. Infections of COVID-19 range from mild to severe. Some never have symptoms, but at least 187 Nebraskans have died from the disease. Joining us now are two Nebraskans who have recovered from the virus to talk about their experience. Lucas Bilsbach, uh, you picked up the virus on a ski trip in February. Uh, how, how, what, tell me about the symptoms that you started to experience and, and you eventually said you went through three waves and yeah. what, what was that last wave like? Yeah, the last wave was was definitely the most intense. The the previous two, I you know, thought I had COVID, but didn't really for sure. But the last one, um, my fever spiked up to uh, over 104. Um, really saw a lot of um, just weakness. Like if I climbed the the stairs, our bedrooms up on the second floor, climbed the stairs, I had to take a 30 minute break and just lay in my bed without doing anything, just to catch my breath and a lot of concern of even whether I was actually going to catch my breath. Um, it, was, it was pretty intense, but chest tightness, um, that cough that everyone um, talks about is a, is a real thing. Um, you know, dry cough and just hurts, um, but you're not really producing anything um, with it. So, um, but that, that third wave was where it really hit me. Dr. James Failer, you were in New York City for the Creighton basketball game that got canceled at halftime of all things, and you were later uh, hospitalized with COVID, uh, with the COVID virus. Tell us about how that all progressed so quickly. So we got home on a Friday, and I think the next Monday, Sunday I felt well, I you know was able to work out and everything, and then Monday, I in the middle of the night kind of had a bunch of mucus coming from my lungs, and then got up and had mild cough and aches and I called one of the clinics through University of Nebraska. They actually got me in at six that night and I had a result by the next day that it was positive. Um, kind of went for about a week, just achy, not feeling great. But then this week into it thing where people, things get bad, I started having trouble breathing and uh, probably with my thinking a little bit. and. I called a private ambulance to take me down to University of Nebraska and they watched me for about a day and then said it was time to intubate me and so it was I think 22 days or something like that which I don't remember and another five or six in ICU just trying to get me awake and not in a delirium before I could go to the regular floor wow. for another week. <laughs> Lucas, uh, tell me about, you, you, you have family at home too. Did, did they have any symptoms when they were around you? Or? No, um, thankfully, right? So uh, yeah, we've got three little kids and my, my wife. Um, my wife never showed a, a single symptom. Uh, you know, I, and we haven't been, she hasn't been tested for the antibodies to know whether she was just asymptomatic. I, I think you know, the assumption is she probably is. Um, my kids, um, my son had a sickness as we were coming back from the, the ski trip. He had a cough, just kind of a low grade fever, um, but only missed, you know, one day of school um, immediately upon back and then was like right back at it. And, uh, you know, we we saw some other symptoms um, in some of our younger kids, um, but they they never even missed a day of school with it. And everyone else was great. So what do you say to those people who look at COVID-19 and say somebody who is young with no underlying health conditions, it's not going to be a big deal? 
Yeah, I think that was the, the biggest surprise for me, was just how much it, it impacted me. I was out sick for um, three to four weeks, like really not able to do anything. And then even coming out of that, it was another three to four weeks where I really felt good about getting out and, and say exercising or being able to work and exert yourself. Um, and so I, I, I definitely, you know, to anyone out there, I, I think it does need to be taking, taken real because even if you are, have some mild symptoms, um, which I, you know, compared to Dr. Failer, I think I'm a, a really good um, example of someone who didn't have to go through that, but at the same time, it was really impactful during that time period. And Dr. Failer, you were part of the remdesivir clinical trial at UNMC. Uh, was there any hesitation about joining that trial, and, and how did you feel so, about how the drug worked? So, uh, I was on, on a ventilator. The, the night they asked was like the worst night where, you know, the ICU doctors went and told my family I might die that night. And then after that, someone comes and asks, do you want to be in the trial? You might get it or you might not. So, you know, that was a hard decision for them that they said, you know, they, they trusted the doctors there and it sounded like it was worth doing. And, and so they went ahead with it. And, but it was still emotional as to, if you think it's going to help, why don't you just give it? And that's probably why they ended the trial a little soon too, because, or, I don't know if I want to say a little soon, but some people say, say that uh, because people want to get a drug if you think it's going to help. And they showed that people got out of the hospital and their symptoms got better faster. They didn't quite show if it changed uh, mortality. So, Doctor, as we wind down our time together, just tell me what kind of impact this has had on you. You've been through so much. You know, what's, what's your, how has it changed you? Has it changed you? Well, I lost about 30 pounds. <laughs> I think I put seven or eight back on, though. Uh, you know, just working with people, appreciating what people at the hospital did for me, the doctors, and especially the nurses that have to pick you up and roll you around or put up with you afterwards when you're in delirium and, uh, you know, probably not acting too appropriately. So uh, it's just to appreciate the the care we have in Nebraska and all, all the good people and um, I've been doing things you know to rehab walking exercising that kind of thing and and uh, I'm grateful to my family because they're really the ones that had to go through everything I I kind of slept through it all yeah Lucas what about you I mean uh, are you still feeling some of the effects and, and how has this changed you yeah I I would say there's there's still some effects it's mainly just like lung capacity um, but that that's been improving week over week. Um, I, I feel, I, I would call it, you know, I'm back to 95%, but I'm, you know, probably eight weeks out now. So it's, uh, it's taken a long road to get there, um, but uh, it, it's, it's coming along. Well, we're so glad you were both able to come through it and join us here on the program. Thank you so much and best of luck with your continued recovery. Dr. James Failer, emergency medicine at Nebraska Medicine, and also uh, Lucas Bilsbach, uh, another COVID survivor as well. Thank you again both for being with us. Thank you. While many Nebraskans transitioned to working from home to limit the spread of the virus, healthcare workers have put in more hours than ever. The Grand Island area was one of the earliest hot spots for the virus, and some healthcare workers traveled to other parts of the country to help with overwhelmed hospital systems. Here are two Nebraskans working on the front lines. So at least from once the pandemic started, uh, the way it, it was kind of a dynamic shift. Uh, we started seeing a lot more uh, people needing ventilators, a lot more people needing increasing amount of oxygen, a lot more people in respiratory distress. Uh, so the volume of people needing uh, coming in sick were much higher. So a lot of these folks needed to be in the ICU, they needed to be on ventilators. So we were seeing a lot more sick people coming in. I've seen folks with minimal to no symptoms to needing a little bit of oxygen to needing ventilators. So it's been all across the board. And I've also seen all age groups, people with absolutely no underlying illnesses to folks with a lot of illnesses, uh, ranging from being very sick to being very sick and actually getting better. From a patient standpoint and just for us, uh, it, was, it was very different because we had, there were no family members at bedside. So we did play a lot of that role too, which I think 
is different. We also, on every patient, had uh, a little cheat sheet where we talked to the families about what were their hobbies, what do they like, what do they generally eat, what do they do on a day-to-day -day basis when they, before they got ill, uh, what do they like to do, things of that nature, which was really helpful. We had, uh, had a resident who speaks really good Spanish, and uh, actually two of them, and they stepped up. They were like, if you're busy, we can talk to family, we can update them. So there was always somebody to help out with every single piece of it. My name is Nathan Cottle. I graduated in 2015 from Howells Dodge Consolidated High School. I had my CNA license, so I decided to get a position in trauma at Bryan Medical Center West Campus, which is their trauma unit. I got a phone call from a friend, or I think a Snapchat, and he basically was like, hey, I have this crazy opportunity I'm going to do. And so he hooked me up with the number and I sat for a while on the number thinking, okay, what do I want to do? Do I want to do this? Do I not? Do I want to go to New York City? My, my technical term is an RN clinical lead. However, I help oversee, I feel like 16 plus facilities with all the account managers who are all nurses and nurse practitioners. I am tired. I'm physically and mentally wore out. I work, you know, 14, 15 plus hours each and every day. We're having over, you know, 600 plus deaths each and every 24 hours. We are putting bodies in food cooler trucks. You know, family members are dying in these hospitals and no one's allowed in there. Could you imagine passing away by yourself? No loved ones around, no friends or family, no one. You alone. You might not even have a nurse in that room with you because they're so overwhelmed with so many patients and having such a huge patient load. It is horrible here. It's very chaotic. Um, but you know, we have to keep our hopes up. We have to remain optimistic and we have to remain positive. The pandemic impacted each and every one of us in some way, including the youngest Nebraskans. With schools and daycare centers shut down for weeks, Kids have experienced a major change. Here's how two of them coped. Hi, I'm Delaney Grace. And I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. The coronavirus affects people. And you get all the germs all over your body. You gotta wear masks right here. People can't come in your house. And when you get food, food, like a box, and with food in it, you gotta wash your hands when you hold it. Like a donut box or a pizza box. School is closed. We can't, we can't um, work there. We can't. Play there, we can't go on the playground and can't see your friends. But you can't see you can see your friends on the computer or your phone or your iPad. Hi, my name is Clifford Wagner. I live in Nebraska City. The things during the pandemic I miss my friends, my teachers and my family. So that's why I became bored because you can't I can't see anybody really. So that's why I built this plane. Because you can see more things up in the air than you can on the ground. And when the Wright brothers built the airplane, I thought maybe I could do that. And so I gathered some boards and just started screwing them together. Smart young man. As Nebraskans work through the challenges of everyday life, historians are already working to preserve these experiences for future generations. The Nebraska History Museum is gathering items for a COVID-19 collection. My name is Jordan Miller. I'm the collections registrar here at the Nebraska History Museum. So the COVID collection started right about mid-March when things were kind of starting to hear, heat up in Nebraska. And my supervisor and I knew that this was big and we needed to do something about it. One thing that we're really trying to get is pieces that show the creativeness that people are taking to still show their friends and family that they care and that they love them. And that's as simple as a donut on a front porch. Or we also got some signs that 
some folks took to their mom who was at Madonna and so they couldn't physically be with her on Mother's Day and they made signs to hang in their window. People forget things really easily and even though things are digital, those digital pieces still hold a lot of meaning like the artwork people are creating and the videos that people take time and effort to do. Those have a really big impact. When I went to Sandy's this weekend to get the half gallon of Elk Creek water, the woman was like, you're gonna do what with this? And it's like, yeah, this is literally going into a museum. Like what you are doing might not seem like history, but this is, this is it, you are making history. One of the things that we've collected that has been the most surprising is the response to the children's journals. Kids worrying about their parents losing their farms because the wheat prices are going down, or um, people being separated from their parents because their their folks are choosing to not go home because they're working with so many people and they don't want to put their other families at risk. And kids that are really, really aware of the big picture of what's going on in the nation. And it's it's heartbreaking. I know it's going to matter to Nebraskans in the future. And I want them to be able to understand how people experience this, how individuals experience it, how businesses and business owners have experienced it. And I want them to be thankful that we went to the lengths that we did to tell the full and complete story. And that's why we want to have every sector, every person, every race in, in the collection so we, aren't, we don't have those missing pieces. That's all for this season of Speaking of Nebraska, but our work covering the coronavirus pandemic and the ongoing protests over race and law enforcement is far from over. Follow our coverage online at netnebraska.org slash news. We'll be back in a few months with more episodes of Speaking of Nebraska, and we'll continue to bring you in-depth discussions about the news topics that impact Nebraskans across the state. Until then, I'm NET News Director Dennis Kellogg. Thanks for watching.